Hey everybody, it's Kyle here, and welcome to another video for level design. Wait, not breakdown. I was almost going to say breakdown, but it's um, level design basics. And we're only going to be covering two points today. So what do we have here? We are looking at BSP workflow, namely my BSP workflow. And this is actually theory, so I'm just going to put a note here. Design for adventure games. I'm going to put dash T H E O R Y. Um, so design for adventure games theory. I'm going to throw that in. So this video is going to be laced with a lot of theory, mainly because adventure games just have just that little bit extra sort of depth when it comes to applying all the theory of level design. So uh, it's going to be very theory heavy, but I'm still going to be showing you guys my BSP workflow. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so here we are in Unreal Engine 4. And in case you're wondering, today's video, unless you weren't paying attention to the first bit, of course, in case you're wondering, today's video is going to be all about BSP level design. And we are here in Unreal Engine 4 um, because it has BSP native. And I only want to use the native tools when it comes to level design so that you don't really have to spend your money on anything else. Um, I am not advertising <laughs> after all. I don't get paid to do that, so I won't do any of that. Moving on though, <laughs> um, today's, like I said, today's going to be all about BSP level design, but also I'll be recovering or revising the um, second video, I think it was, which was about um, level design for adventure games. Now let's click play and I'll give you guys a virtual tour and explain a little bit more what um, I'm talking about. Uh, in terms of level design. So there are different kinds of adventure games now. There's You've got the typical side-scroller, side-scrolling platformer game. Um, some are still adventure games like um, Fez would be a side-scrolling adventure game. Um, Mega Man would be a side-scrolling adventure game. Super Mario? Um, I, it's an arcade adventure but it's an adventure game nonetheless. You've also got games like Amnesia and Outlast and well, all those uh, all those uh, first-person horror games that have been coming out. Those are adventure games too. Um, you've also got some more uh, compli uh, not complicated, complex um, games such as Kingdom Hearts. Which, by the way, if I stand here in the shadows, if I stand here and sort of look across, um, for those of you who have played Kingdom Hearts one. Before, this is Traverse Town, and this is the second bit. Or uh, at least this is like a, a mini version of it. I've, I haven't actually played Kingdom Hearts in a, in quite a while. Um, but as far as I can remember, this is what Traverse Town sort of, kind of looked like. <laughs> but I know for sure that this isn't um, as big as it was. So, again, this video is going to be all about BSP level design. And as well, um, I'm going to throw it in whenever I can, all about the principles of um, adventure game level design. So without further ado, let's go straight into the build process. Right, so here we are in Unreal Engine. And for this video, I'm not going to talk too much about my build process. I mean, it's all here. Um, I'll talk, uh, I think I'll end up talking a little bit more about uh, adventure game level design theory. Uh, but let's start with my build process anyway. So if you're if you've used UDK or Unreal Engine three, Unreal Engine four is not going to be the interface interface wise. It's and basic native tools wise, it's going to be exactly the same. Um, the only difference here would likely be the use of well my use of the BSP brushes or the BSP tools. So, uh, for those of you who are wondering um, about what tools I use when it comes to BSP level design, I actually only use the cube brush. I don't use anything else. I mean, there are stairs and things like that, but when it comes to actually designing the levels, I like to see everything in their most simple forms possible. So, when it comes to stairs, they're just ramps to me at a design phase. I mean, it's kind of like concept art. Um, that's the way I see level design. Um, it's like concept art. Oh, well, first pass level design, that is, uh, not the final thing. 
Um, so first pass level design to me is like concept art. So you want to get the major forms down. You want to get the idea, the mood and feel down before you get anything else. So really, for me, the cube brush is enough. And all I do is just resize things and um, sh uh, move things around and all that. Really, it's it's not the best BSP workflow. I mean, I know people who have made entire games using just the BSP for their environment, and it's worked quite well for them. Um, however, for me, I like using static meshes because I can go into that sort of, I get that extra layer of detail that BSP just can't provide. So things like collapsed walls or piles of rubble and things like that, you can't do that in BSP. Um, it, it would be crazy. Uh, for you to do that in BSP. So there are two major brushes that, two major functions of BSP that you should be using, but I don't use in this video, um, mainly because I didn't actually need it. Um, and those two major uses are subtractive and additive. So if you're wondering what subtractive is, oh, sorry, let's start with additive. Additive basically does what it says. It adds the, uh, the geometry that you see here in the scene. Subtractive is obviously the opposite of that. It's gonna sort of cut things away and that's how you sort of get like cuts in the floor, cuts in the walls and things like that. That's how you make a doorway in BSP. Um, and that's how you make a window in BSP using um, subtractive brushes. Uh, another cool thing about BSP is that everything comes pre-unwrapped. So all your geometry, all your CSG is pre-unwrapped. It's done. You don't have to do any more unwrapping and you don't have to fiddle around in 3ds Max or Maya or whatever you're using. Uh, it's all it's all finished. Um, another advantage is you can sort of tell the BSP pieces like to s where to scale, like how how much uh, how much tiling you want in the actual geometry itself. Um, for me, however, a lot of the artists that I worked with they prefer to use static meshes. So whenever the issue of using BSP comes up. They say, well, just use static meshes because you want to, you should be able to know how much tiling you want in your texture anyway. Because when it comes to dealing with static meshes or with textures for your environment, if you, if you're not careful, you could end up having, um, what's what I think it's called off scaling. And basically off scaling is what happens when you have one texture that looks high res and one texture that isn't so high res. So um, that's why I prefer to replace everything with static meshes because in that way I know how big the actual mesh is um, and how much tiling the texture is doing. I'd rather not leave that up to the engine uh, to be perfectly honest. So that's why everything gets replaced by static meshes. Now onto uh, level design theories for adventure games. So if you're familiar with the basic theories of level design, um, when it comes to building your adventure game, those uh, theories carry more weight than they would in any other kind of game. Um, on a level design sort of, le uh, <laughs> on a level design level, on a design perspective, from the design perspective, um, those theories just carry that much more weight. So if you're making a game like, um, what's a first person adventure game, say like Outlast or Amnesia or something like that, Stanley Parable even. Um, if, you've, if you're gonna make a game like that, then you need to be able to give the player visual cues. So what's a visual cue? A visual cue is basically how, how do I explain this without confusing myself? A visual cue can be things like cutscenes. Um, so basically, you know, the player has no control, things are playing out, the story is being told. Uh, you have interactive cutscenes, which are basically like, um, kind of like Mass Effect style conversations. Um, but not just that, you've also got, um, what is it? In Uncharted, there's also the, there are also particular bits where you can sort of walk around and the characters would still be conversing with each other. Um, that's another kind of visual cue that you could have because often during those times while you're still, while you still have control over your character, 
the character that you're playing as, um, the story is still being told, and that's um, that's one of the cool things about having um, visual cues. Oh, well, the freedom to have any kind of visual cue you want. But in terms of adventure games, visual cues are extremely important. Now, it's not just um, a cutscene that you can use as a visual cue. You can also use audio. Wait, that's that's not a visual cue. Um, let's backtrack. Um, you can use lighting. Lighting is, um, well, the only other kind of visual cue that's easy to implement. I mean, there's plenty of visual cue sort of ideas that you can sort of bounce around and test, but lighting and cutscenes would be the first, the two easiest methods to sort of guide the player along. Um, I would encourage you to experiment. Um, and moreover, it depends on the kind of game that you're working on. So again, let's go back to, um, let's go back to Amnesia or something like that. Uh, you, there aren't many cutscenes in the game. In fact, what? There's only one cutscene that I remember, and that was the only the only cutscene from Amnesia was that opening bit where you sort of wake up and you're kind of dazed. And really, in that opening um, cutscene, it was all about well, you're here, right? You have to get there, and you have to follow. I think it was like flower petals or something. Um, you have to follow them down some corridor, and then the game just pretty much um, you just play the game from there. Um, you don't need that many visual cues for that, or at least you don't need obvious visual cues like cutscenes for a first person adventure game because everything is happening as the game is being played. Whereas for a game like Kingdom Hearts, you would definitely need those cutscenes. There are things that sort of uh, need to be explained that you as the player probably shouldn't um, ignore um, because if you are playing like Amnesia, style game. Just think about this for a second. You're playing an amnesia style game and you decide to put in a cutscene, like a lengthy cutscene, like in Kingdom Hearts where sort of characters are in, sort of interacting with each other. Well, first of all, that won't work because, well, you're the only character apart from this creepy dude that's walking around the house in the game. Um, whereas in Kingdom Hearts, if you tried having like an interactive cutscene, so, you know, Sora, the person that you, the character that you play as is allowed to move around the world freely. I mean, it's not gonna, it might work, <laughs> but it probably won't be able to get, they, you probably won't get into the story. I'm sorry. You probably won't get into the story as much as if you just let the cutscene play out. So when it comes to making your adventure games, choose the right um, visual cue. Um, again, uh, and I said this earlier, even though I shouldn't have because it was about visual cues, was using audio. Audio, lighting, and cutscenes. Those are your like basic um, visual cue and uh, basically sensory cue um, tools that you can use for level design in adventure games. Um, just note that if you are using lighting and audio and um, cutscenes and things like that, that they look good and they make sense. That bit, I just, I accidentally minimized Unreal, uh, so you didn't actually miss anything, anything important anyway. And after all, pretty much, I've already explained my workflow for BSP. It's, uh, it's not the cleanest workflow. Uh, in fact, I'm probably not the guy that you should be going to uh, for tips on how to use BSP. But if you do have any like really simple basic questions on using BSP, then I will do my best to answer them. <laughs> um, right, so before you even start building a level, I feel I need to reiterate this for every single one of these basics uh, series videos. Make sure your gameplay is down because I've already demonstrated this today there are all different kinds of adventure games and if you use the wrong kind of cutscene or if you use the sort of if you lay out your level wrong it's just gonna break the game like break the mood and the feel of the game and you don't want that you want something that works um, that sort of pretty much goes hand in hand with the game itself um, if you noticed well if you didn't skip to this section of the video straight away if you did watch the first bit um, there's actually more content there's like, I have like these great big walls um, scattered around the place that surround the entire scene. 
Um, I didn't put that into this part of the video. I just cut that out mainly because, well, it's just the same um, workflow that I have really. It's just BSP is just that easy to get used to. When I started using BSP, I didn't watch any of the tutorials for UDK. That's where I started using BSP um, for my little design. I didn't watch any of the uh, tutorial videos, I just got straight into it and um, only after using it for six months did I actually start watching the videos. So if you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below, but uh, hopefully you learned something today. Okay, so now that we've finished up with that, let's uh, let's have a quick recap. So uh, my BSP workflow. Um, well, we know that with my BSP workflow, it's not exactly the friendliest um, BSP workflow. And again, the reason why I only use the cube brush and sort of resize it and then place it here, there, and delete it is actually for two reasons. One, so that I can sort of maintain my modular sort of workflow, but also because I end up replacing all of my BSP brushes with static meshes anyway. So. That's the reason why I use um, just the very basic cube brush. Now you don't have to do it that way. There are so many different ways, so much freedom that you have with BSP that there isn't really a set um, set of rules. So let's check that off anyway. So remember that even though my workflow works for me, it might not work for you. In fact, I would encourage you to find your own workflow, something that you're comfortable with. I'm only here to show you guys how I go about doing things and what makes things easier for me. However, one of the big things about this video was, of course, the design theory for adventure games. Now, let's have a recap. So you've got your visual cues, things like cutscenes and interactive cutscenes, so cinematic and interactive cutscenes. You've got lighting and you've got audio. So these things are super important for adventure games. And the more complex it is, the more in depth you have to go into. So let's check that off. However, I should also note that when it comes to applying these design theories, it depends on the game. So let's note that down. Depends on the, I'm a very slow writer. I'm much faster when it comes to typing. It depends on the game. Let's put an exclamation mark there because it's a super important theory. So let's, uh, let's have an, another quick sort of more in-depth recap. So Kingdom Hearts, let's write Kingdom Hearts, KH and KH2, and subsequently KH3, would likely benefit more from having cinematic cutscenes to explain backstory and the elements of the game, whereas with something like Outlast, let's write that down, Outlast, or Amnesia, Amnesia is the other one, oh, wait, I, was, I, I can spell, I promise, I can spell, let's, <laughs> Amnesia, there we go. With Amnesia, obviously, it's going to be lighting and sounds and other subtle visual cues that you're going to want to focus on. So that wraps it up for this video. In case you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. However, until next time, thanks for watching. Bye.